I got to tell you, my, my heart is so filled. Um, our Christmas Eve services were just a, just a tremendous, tremendous um, celebration to the Lord and everything that God has been doing. And then the worship this morning as well. Thank you so much for coming out and just worshiping in spirit and truth. Today we're going to finish our series that we started a few weeks ago called All I Want for Christmas. And we've looked at a number of different things that we truly in our heart may want at this time of year. The first week we learned that all I may want is some peace and quiet. And we learned about how to receive peace from God to have the peace of God. So we can be agents of peace for God to people around us. Then the second week, we said all I want is a break from the fake. is just to be real, to be honest, to be transparent. Then we looked at something to smile about, true joy. And we learned that joy is not dependent on circumstances, that's happiness. But we learn the source of true joy is Christ ruling in our lives. And there seems to be a new tradition that's taking place when giving gifts. Have you ever noticed? You give someone a gift, and when they open it up, it seems like before they've even been able to say anything to you, you say, don't worry, if you don't like it, or it doesn't fit, or you'd like to have something else, I've got the receipt. I've got the gift receipt, so you can take it back for what you really, really want. Anybody else ever seen that around, right? And it seems like it's just become part of the whole thing. Like, as soon as they open it, don't worry if you don't like it. Don't worry if it's not what you want. I got the receipt. Then you can get what you really, really want. Saturday, yesterday, was the biggest shopping day of the year. It used to be Black Friday. Not anymore. Now it's the day after Christmas. And I can testify that it's true. I saw you out there. I saw the parking lot. I saw the lines that we had to stand in. And so as a result, people are saying, really, all I want for Christmas is a gift with a receipt. So I can take it back and get what I really want. It's interesting. Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. You know, the wonderful thing about Christ is he's not a gift with a receipt. Because you never want to give him back. Amen? You never want to give him back because of what he provides. And so today, we're going to talk about the issue of contentment. True contentment. Now, contentment is not a passive case, sirrah, sirrah. Contentment is not just kind of sitting around and saying, well, whatever, it's going to be okay, everything will be just fine. We're going to find, as we look at three different passages today, that teach us about true contentment, not about gifts, that's not what it's about, but about life itself. Because so often, life hands us something we don't want. Life hands us a situation that we don't want. And we find that the writers of the New Testament, when they write and speak about contentment, these were not people who had an easy life. They were persecuted. They were in prison. They were in hardship. They were suffering. We also find that when the Apostle Paul talks about contentment, he's not one of those guys that you would picture sitting around the campfire just saying, well, whatever it is, whatever it is, it's fine. This guy was driven. He was focused. I mean, he was driven to change the world for Christ. So we're talking about someone, when he talks about contentment, he, we're talking about someone who had a focus, who had a drive, who had a passion. So maybe you're in a situation where you feel like your life is out of control and you're not sure what to do about it. 
So when you even think about the idea of contentment, it's really hard. Because your situation outside of yourself seems totally out of control. Recently, our like-minded support group watched a series of messages by Andy Stanley that had a great impact on all of us. And he asked his question, what do you do when there's nothing you can do? What do you do when you're in a situation and there's nothing you can do to change the situation? There's no action steps. There's nothing you can do to control what goes on outside of you. And yet, we're told to be content. Maybe it's a health issue, and the doctors have given you a report, and there's nothing you can do about it. What do you do when there's nothing you can do? Maybe it's a relationship that you have with your spouse or with your parents or with your children, and it's to a point where there's nothing you can do about it to change it. There's no more steps that you can take to change it. What do you do when there's nothing you can do? Or maybe your finances. You've done everything you can, but you're in such a tight situation, you're not sure how you can truly be content because you constantly find that gap at the end of the month. So we're going to look at three passages of Scripture that teach us about contentment. But first off, what is contentment? Contentment is that inner peace, that inner calmness, that inner sense of control when everything outside of you is out of control. Contentment is that inner sense of peace when everything around you is out of control last night. Many of you may have heard the news from the Dallas, Texas area. The Rowlett Garland area where we came from, where we, our church was located, was hit by three or four tornadoes. Nine people so far have been found dead as a result of it. And we were getting all kinds of Facebook messages, text messages of people who were huddled in their closets in their home while the tornado came through. We experienced that once when we lived in Texas. It was a horrible experience. All of us huddled into this closet, waiting for the tornado to go by. And it sounds like a locomotive is coming through. And you're not sure what's going to happen. That's the picture of a sense of safety when everything outside is totally out of control. So what do you do? How do you find it? The first passage I want you to turn to is Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in the seat in front of you, or you can follow on the screen. Now, we need to understand the author of Hebrews is writing to a group of believers who were under severe persecution. They were under persecution to such a point that when you read these verses, you can understand these are not people who are just living in a good, well-ordered world. They were under pressure. They were under persecution for their faith. Look what it says, starting at verse 1. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Why does he say this? He's saying because of the persecution that was going on, people would infiltrate into the house churches to turn on people. And so as a result, believers became afraid. And they wouldn't open up their home to strangers because they weren't sure if it was somebody infiltrating. Read verse 3. Continue to remember those who are in prison as if you were together with them in prison and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. They were in prison because of their faith. And he's saying, remember those who are being persecuted for their faith. Don't be afraid, but remember and understand. Read on. 
Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. Why does he put that in there? Because believers who were being persecuted were being separated from their family, and there was a temptation to be unfaithful to your spouse who is in prison, who is being mistreated. And so he says, remember, keep yourselves pure. Then verse 5, keep your lives free from the love of money. And B, read it with me, content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortal man do to me? See, what he's saying is, in the midst of this pressure, in the midst of the difficulty, in the midst of the persecution, fear was driving these people from doing what God wanted them to do. Here's the first key to contentment. He says here, keep yourself free from the love of money and be content with what you have. See, what he was saying is this. You need to understand when you're under this kind of pressure, you're going to hold on to your money. You're going to hold on to your money because you're afraid. You're not sure you're going to have enough for the next meal. You're not sure you're going to have enough for the next activity, the next thing that you've got to pay off. And so fear can hold people back from being content. So the key, the first key is this, to to understand contentment is this, remember his presence. Remember his presence. That's why the apostle here writes in and quoting in verse 6, he says, therefore we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortal man do to me? See, it's wrapped up in a person. Contentment, he says here, is found by remembering God's presence with you so you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. And so often I've found believers have a hard time in regards to being content because they're afraid of what's going to happen with what they have. So when they're under that kind of pressure, they hold back instead of giving. They hold back instead of being generous because you're afraid. And the writer to the Hebrews is saying, don't be afraid. Remember his presence. He is with you. Now, I came across a video that I think sums this up very well as to the importance of remembering his presence. Watch carefully. Remember his presence. 
when you get up in the morning, before your feet hit the floor, remind yourself, I will not be afraid because the Lord is here with me. Remember his presence so that as a result, when we look at the situation, we look at the circumstances all around us, and we're caused ourselves to have this fill, this fear, to be filled with this anxiety, remember his presence. And then you can be content in the midst of it. Mark Batterson, who's a pastor of National Community Church in Washington, D.C., gives this great quote. He says, Jesus came to our place 2,000 years ago. He took our place on the cross, and he invites us back to his place for eternity. That's the whole idea. Remember his presence. Remember the fact that he came and he said, when you put your faith and trust in him, I will never leave you. Therefore, you can be content. Remember his presence. Let's go to the second passage, 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting in verse 6 to verse 8. The apostle Paul says this, But godliness, read it with me, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Read that with me again. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Read on. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Pretty clear. Pretty clear, pretty straightforward that godliness plus contentment creates great gain. Because in that context, Paul is saying to Timothy, don't pursue stuff. Pursue him. Pursue godliness because godliness with contentment is great gain. Recently, Kim and I were talking through some um, issues in regards to how we were going to get all of us to our different places to work that day and there were four of us that had to get to work with three cars and she was like what are we going to do and I said yeah let's talk through this whole thing and who's going to drop off whom and who's going to pick up whom whoever and I was reminded of a Francis Chan quote that he was talking about a similar situation he said this that is a rich person's problem bam right between my eyes We are so rich. Compared to the rest of the world, we are so rich. You'd take a trip to Romania. You'd take a trip to Haiti, like our team is right now. You'd take a trip into those situations, and you find that the people there are so rich spiritually because all they have is Jesus. And they are totally dependent on him totally focused on him. And it's so easy for us to get off focus because of our stuff. Now listen, the scripture makes it clear. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father. There's nothing wrong with having things. There's nothing wrong with having nice things. The hard thing is when nice things and things have you and have me. And so as a result, Paul says, godliness with contentment is great gain. And then he says, says, if we got food and clothing, we'll be content. Now, what about a place to live? That's basically what he's talking about. He's talking about the necessities of what you need. See, the first thing is I need to remember his presence. The second thing that will help you in regards to contentment is to focus on what is important. To focus on what is important. And that's what we find happening here. Paul is saying to Timothy, Timothy, godliness, pursuing Christ, pursuing him, pursuing truth, going after what really matters, plus contentment is great gain. Because so often we live in a world that's not content. And we as believers are not content. And so we find the Apostle Paul makes it clear. He says, focus on what is important. And so often I encourage you to take a step to serve other people. Because when you serve other people, you're able to show other people your love and the love of Christ. But it also reminds you 
what's most important. What's most important. Remember his presence. Focus on what's important. Let's look at the third passage. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Now Paul here is writing from a prison in Rome. And he's writing back to the believers in Philippi, to the church in Philippi. And he's writing back to them to thank them for a gift, for a care package that they sent to him. For the fact that they took care of him. Look what it says in verse 10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. The word renew there is like the idea of a flower blossoming again. In other words, they had taken care of him in the past, but now he says, I really rejoice that, that you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but didn't have an opportunity to show it. See, what would happen here is it says Paul is in prison in Rome. It takes time for word to get back to Philippi that he's in prison. So they finally hear about it. They then send him a package. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned To be content. Let's read that verse, verse 11 again. Let's read it together. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content. How? Whatever the circumstances. Paul says, look, I'm not saying thank you for the gift because I needed it, because I've learned to be content. Content. There are three key words you're going to find in this passage of Scripture. Learn, the next word is secret, and the third is contentment. Look what he says. I've learned to be content. You know what that tells me? It's a process. It's a process. You know what it also tells me? We can learn to be content. Turn to your neighbor and say, I can learn to be content. Do it right now. It didn't sound very convincing to me at all right now. But we can. We can learn to be content. It's not something, look at me. You can stop talking to your neighbor now. Now you can look at me, all right? It's not something God just zaps you with. I'm content. No, he says, I've learned to be content. And in the context, he says, sometimes I'm in need. And sometimes I have a lot. But he says, I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. And if you go to the Greek, the word whatever means whatever. It means whatever the circumstances. You say, yeah, 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 yeah. But you don't know mine. No, the word whatever covers them all. Paul says, I've learned to be content whatever The circumstances read on. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content. Read it with me. In any and every situation. See what he says here? I've learned, meaning it's a process, meaning there's a goal, meaning I can do it. I can learn it. I've learned to be content. Now he says, I've learned the secret. The word used here for secret was used of a special initiation for those that were part of a secret club or group. What Paul is saying is, we are part of a secret group because we have a relationship with Christ. And we can say, I've learned to be content. Not only I've learned to be content, I've learned the secret. Okay, I don't know about you. Tell me. Tell me what it is. Paul, tell me the secret. I won't tell anybody. Tell me the secret. He says, I've learned to be content. It's a process. Then he says, I've learned the secret. Anybody else want to know what the secret is? I mean, isn't that an issue we all struggle with in regards to being content with either our circumstances or our situation or what we've got or what we don't have, what we did get or didn't get at Christmas time? I've learned to be content. Then he repeats it and says, I've learned the secret. All right, Paul, tell me the secret. Read on. 
So I've learned the secret, whether in plenty or in want, whether well-fed or hungry, verse 13. Read it with me. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Read it with me again. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Notice what he's saying. We need to remember his presence. We need to focus on what is important. Here's the third thing. You need to depend on his power. See, to be content, Paul says, here's the secret. I can't. He can and I give him permission to do it through me. I can't be content on my own. I can't, but he can, and I give him permission to do it through me. Whatever your situation, whether it's relationship, health, finance, whatever the situation is, family, whatever the issue is, and you're saying, I can't take it one more day. That's okay to say. I can't, but he can, and he can through me. He says, here's the secret. Remember his presence. He's with you, so you don't have to be afraid. Focus on what's important and depend on his power. And being willing to say, I can't, but he can, and he can through me. And I've found that when I get up and I look at my day and I looked at everything that's facing me, I need to say, I can't, but you can and I give you permission to do it through me. Going into a counseling situation, not sure what to say, not sure how to respond. I can't, you can, and I give you permission to do it through me. Looking at the circumstances around me and looking at people that, that I'm concerned about, I wanna see life change take place, but I can't do anything about it. I can't, you can and I give you permission to do whatever it is you want to do through me. Contentment comes by remembering his presence, by focusing on what's important, and by depending on his power. The key to contentment, the gift of Christmas, the gift that you all have and we all have if we've trusted Christ, the key to contentment is to remind yourself that all you need, you have because you got Jesus and he is enough. So as a result, we can understand what it is he's saying. And the next time discontentment comes knocking at your door, remember what you need is what you got because you got him. And he's enough. As I finish, I came across a verse this morning to me that is a beautiful verse to pray. I don't even have a slide for it because I just came across it this morning. It, this is from Psalm 16:5. David says this: Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. Remember his presence. Focus on what's important and depend on his power. Let's pray. Father in heaven, it's so easy to be discontented. And I pray today that you remind us that Christ is enough, that you have given us all we need because we have him. And help us to focus on 
connecting with him, with his peace, with his presence, with his power, so we can truly experience the joy of contentment. In Jesus' name.